Um, I, oh, there is a timer. Okay, good. Uh, I, I wanted to just share with you a clinical technique that I've had some fun with over the last, I'd say, uh, three, four years, and I've called this the Lazarus graft. There's, as you know, a big change in implant dentistry. Uh, a trend today is focusing on minimally invasive procedures so patients have less morbidity, less pain, faster recovery. And that's really changed our practices quite a bit, so I'm doing less grafting today than I did, for instance, five, 10 years ago. And I think there's this big emphasis on how do we minimize morbidity but not compromise outcomes. When we look at heart tissue augmentation procedures, for many years we've considered autologous bone as the gold standard. Um, and that's earned a reputation historically as well as biologically. For those of you that haven't seen this, this is called the tissue engineering triad. So we're looking at signaling molecules that autologous bone has, growth factors, primarily BMP. It has this bone mineral scaffold, and there are cells that are transplanted with the graft, whether they're osteoblasts or mesigamal stem cells. And all this together, if you give it adequate time in the proper environment, is going to lead to bone regeneration. As you know, the disadvantages of autologous bone, main disadvantage is bone donor site morbidity. Um, it takes time to harvest these grafts. There's a limited supply as how much bone we can get. Usually it will require anesthesia for bigger grafts. It might require hospitalization and definitely requires uh, added surgical training. So there's a trend away from using a Taj's bone that continues today. And as I said, we have implant alternatives where different size implants are using tilted implants to avoid the sinus, other procedures, where we're looking at augmentation procedures that we can avoid the use of a tigus bone. And that trend continues today. In the future, we'll focus more on tissue engineering options. So if we look at this tissue engineering triad, we have to fulfill all three arms. So we'll look at growth factors. For instance, if we're using recombinant BMP2, we'll use that with a scaffold that requires support to protect the graft. So usually today that's titanium mesh. And we will add uh, some type of bone mineral product as something as a, an added matrix, matrix. Um, cells are, are not transplanted with this graft, but it's going to attra attract mesenchymal stem cells that will be induced by the BMP to become osteoblasts. So here's a clinical case. This is a patient that was kicked in the mouth by a horse. And you can see she had a mandible fracture as well. This happened uh, several years earlier. So she has a cant to her mandible and she's missing several teeth. Uh, so my wife, Catherine Mish, who's a prosthodontist, did the diagnostic workup on the patient. And you can see from the CT scan that she has quite a bone deficiency here. Our goal here is not to rebuild this patient back to normal anatomy. This patient wants to eliminate a removable prosthesis. So my goal here is to simply augment the site so I can place enough implants to support something fixed for her. So you look at this quite deficient ridge, and in the past, this is something that I would use an autogenous graft to uh, repair. But with this case, I'm using a titanium mesh to contain recombinant BMP2 mixed with a mineralized bone allograft. It's covered with a platelet concentrate, primary closure, this is six months later uh, after the graft is incorporated. You see the exposure of the mesh. This is the pseudoperiosteum that's under the mesh. And you can see under the pseudoperiosteum is a very nice uh, bone that's de novo bone formation that's occurred. And now I'm able to place multiple implants into this graft to be able to support a fixed prosthesis. So here's the preoperative condition. And now she has fixed prostheses in the maxilla and mandible. Uh, I've published a number of uh, papers on, on BMP. This is one on using BMP for vertical augmentation with titanium mesh. Uh, I work with uh, Oli Jensen, Mike Picos, and Jay Malmquist. We collected data on vertical augmentation cases. And what's encouraging with this approach is we're able to achieve vertical bone growth that's quite comparable to what we've been able to achieve with a tagus bone. There are some disadvantages with this technique that I don't have time to go into. But at least when we look at measurements, the mean vertical augmentation was about eight and a half millimeters uh, in this study. The disadvantages of titanium mesh, however, 
Number one, we have to go back and remove it. We have to take it out. And that can take time, and it can be a little bit tedious as well, as, especially if you get soft tissue ingrowth into the area. And then the other big complication um, that's reported in the literature is the potential for exposure of the mesh. If this happens early on, it's quite devastating. If it happens later on, it doesn't have the same consequences. But it's still a complication we'd like to avoid if possible. So the focus is, in the future is going to be on looking at resorbable scaffolds. Um, we're not quite there yet with most alloplastic products. So I started to look at is what resorbable scaffold can I work with in combination with recombinant BMP2. So instead of using a titanium mesh, I'm looking at the use of an allogeneic bone block to act as the support, to act as the scaffold uh, for this growth factor. If you look at the literature on allogeneic blocks in implant dentistry, one thing to appreciate, there's different types of allogeneic blocks, freeze-dried, irradiated, fresh-frozen. Um, so this study combines the data on all these different types of products. Um, it's quite encouraging to see that there's only nine uh, failures in this study um, out of 361 blocks, and that's usually due to early exposure. I think what's impressive as well is when you start to look at how much horizontal augmentation you can achieve with these types of blocks, uh, it's almost five millimeters, which is greater than some of the other techniques we have available. The downside of using allogeneic blocks is in the biology. There's quite a uh, high heterogeneity of the amount of resorption that you get. Sometimes you see a little, sometimes you see a lot. And histologically, as we'll discuss, you don't see a very good turnover of these blocks. With that said, however, implant survival in, in this uh, uh, systematic review found 97% survival of implants uh, up to two years. So studies that have compared otitis bone with allogeneic bone really just show a rather slow turnover. Uh, and that's been the main problem with this type of scaffold. If we focus on studies that have looked at what do growth factors do to bone substitutes, and specifically to allogeneic grafts. You see quite a high bit of turnover, and a much increased turnover of the graft over time and greater replacement. So my thought was, why don't we take recombinant BMP2, mix it with the allogeneic block as their scaffold, and try and improve the biology of the allogeneic block and eliminate the need to have to come back to remove some type of resorbable scaffold. So I've termed this the Lazarus graft. So we're taking a dead piece of bone, essentially, and we're going to bring it back to life through the use of a growth factor. So here's a clinical case. This is a patient that has an atrophic maxilla. Um, inadequate bone is present in the anterior maxilla for implant placement. Here's on one side, I'm going to use the allogeneic block. And specifically, I'm using a product from Rocky Mountain um, Tissue Bank. And what I like about it, it it's harvested from the vertebral column, so it has a thin cortex, and as you'll see, uh, a very tight matrix of the porous uh, area, but it's not so tight that, that bone can't grow into it. So there's a piece of the collagen sponge with BMP that's placed on the interface, and then around the periphery of the block graft, I'm using re uh, resorbable uh, material, a particulate mineralized bone allograft mixed with the recombinant BMP2, and it has to be placed on this collagen sponge. So I'm not soaking the block in it, I'm using the collagen sponge. Covering that with the collagen membrane. This is six months later, and I think what's impressive, if you look at the CT scan immediately after the graft is placed, and then six months later, you can see quite a difference in the radio density of that graft. In addition, I use a GBR procedure on one side and the Lazarus graft on the other, and I think you can see the difference in the amount of volume of the augmentation. Uh, four millimeter implant diameter was used in this case, and there was adequate bone to place implants on the other side, but there's, uh, there's an abundant bone that's uh, lateral to the implants on the other side. And this was restored uh, uh, with fixed prosthe prosthesis in the maxilla and mandible. I really began to reserve this technique not for every horizontal augmentation, it's the challenging horizontal augmentation. So here we have an extremely thin ridge in the premaxilla. I really have limited op options to restore this case. So this is our allogeneic block in place. And again, if you look at this, I'm gonna have to place this implant primarily in the block itself. Six months later, you see good incorporation of the block, placement of implants, and again, 
uh, a good volume of bone is still present lateral to these grafts. This case was referred to me by David Felton, who's now at a dean at Mississippi. Here's a, comp a comparison of an allogeneic block with an autograft block. So I harvested this actually from the tuberosity. She had quite large tuberosity. Uh, and that block is about four millimeters. The Asajj block is about four millimeters uh, in thickness. So you can see you start out with something that's a greater volume. And then six months later, they look very similar, uh, good vascularity uh, between the two and a similar volume that's been accomplished. This case is an interesting patient. She came to me, oh, probably seven years ago, and I told her that she was going to need an autogenous graft from her hip to be able to reconstruct her maxilla for implants. Um, she said, no, I really don't want to do that. Um, I'll just live with my denture, I guess. Um, and then a couple of years ago, she returned to my office and she said, Dr. Misha, I made a mistake. I went somewhere else and they convinced me that they could fix my problem, so they did bilateral sinus grafts. They put posterior implants and these locator attachments. And she said, I'm miserable, because every time I try and bite into something, the denture trips and moves. And she said, I spent a lot of money, it took a lot of time, and I'm, I'm really not getting what I wanted out of this. So I took a look at her and said, you know, the problem here, as I discussed previously, is you don't have adequate bone in the anterior maxilla in the front part of the jaw to place implants. So with the Lazarus technique, I was able to use allogeneic blocks, BMP at the interface and around the periphery, and there you see the, uh, the combined graft around the block itself, covered with a collagen membrane, primary closure, and then six months later, you see very good incorporation of the block grafts. And in this is a very challenging case. Now this patient has adequate bone to place four by eight millimeter implants in the premaxilla. You see the previously placed implants and then the two shorter implants anteriorly. And then she's restored after a four months graft, uh, implant healing with a fixed prosthesis by Dr. Mesh. So, uh, I finished a little early. I'm, I guess we're taking questions at a later time. So I want to thank you for your attention this morning. Look forward to hearing everyone else.